that's what you have to do with everything in your life. You, you know, I, I think you've got to be bold to be honest with yourself. You've got to be really strongly bold to be, because yourself is really hard to deal with. It's easier to holler at somebody else. But when you've got to look at you, that's where the disconnects take place because people can't look at themselves. But you know what? The people who succeed do. Every one of them, the, if, you, uh, if you look at the people who succeed, if you study championship people or people that have done well, they're usually people that can admit what they're no good at. Even in, I mean, you know I watch boxing all the time, and all those guys that were champions, the real ones, you know, that had sense, they could figure out their faults and work on them and fix them. I had to overcome a lot to do that, and I'm sure that it's no different than you. You probably have to overcome things I don't know about. You know, it's not like I'm an exception or something. You probably have things in your history that you need to overcome so you can, you can do it too, good or bad. Some of you might have come through bad churches that left a horrible taste in your mouth and you didn't like church, so you're going to have to overcome it. Some, you know, there's just things you've got to overcome because of the way you were raised or what you've been around. Make sense? But you have to admit it's there. So you have to build properly with the right stone. We all decided Jesus is a cornerstone. Refusal to the cornerstone, um, you know, the, the Bible says that he's the rock you're supposed to fall on. In other words, you're supposed, your will is supposed to break so you can conform to what he wants. He said, so you fall on the rock, right? But if you don't fall on the rock, it falls on you, and it says it grinds your life to powder, which powder is like talcum powder. It, you can get ground that down that far by disobeying God. It's not even disobedience, because, see, when you submit, obedience becomes easy. If you're not submitted, obedience is really hard. You've got to make yourself do things. Whereas if you're broken, you just automatically do them. You understand? It's a, you're, by your nature, you keep the commandments. By your nature. You, you, you want to get to the place where you say, not my will, but your will be done. I'm your servant, Lord, and I'll do anything you want. We sang it for a good 10 minutes here. It was a pretty good song, wasn't it? We sang it. We sang it. But now, we all know this. Singing it and doing it is different. Application is where you find out who you really are. Singing is where you want to be, almost, if you know what I mean. <laughs> kind of. We know when you're singing it, it's a reality because you're doing it by faith. But when you go to implement it, that's when everything in you sticks out that doesn't want to, and that's how you find it. That's why the Bible says he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And it also says in Peter, you, you purify your soul by obeying the truth. So when you obey... Your soul, which is your mind, will, and emotions, get purified. Anybody who's been coming here a long time knows I've said that probably a oh, hundred times, minimum. Your obedience cleanses your soul. That means it can cleanse you of pornography. It can cleanse you of greed. It can cleanse you of selfishness. It can cleanse you of all kind of things because your obedience begins to cleanse you. You, you drive those things out by submission to God. The Bible doesn't say fight the devil. It says submit yourself to God and resist the devil and he will flee. You don't fight the devil. You tell the, you tell the devil to stop with authority. But you, it's not a carnal fight is what I'm telling you. The Bible said submit yourselves to God, resist the devil and he'll flee. A lot of us would get rid of the devil if we just resist him instead of argue with him. Just resist him. That's what the Bible said. Ephesians 6 tells you about the warfare. And he tells you what your weapons are. But submission and resistance is, is really your best defense. Submission and resistance. Uh, unbrokenness will provoke a lot of attacks from, from the devil. Uh, and also finding your purpose does. So it's, you see what I mean? The word is complicated in a way, but in a way it's not. Finding your assignment and doing it is when the devil tries to stop you, but that's where he can't get you because you're under the cover. 
he'll just create a big ruckus. Remember I told you about the cars I got stolen? I got them both back. Well, the reason we got them back is we were submitted in the area of tithing, so God went and got the cars. Okay? If I, and, okay, so that's different. I got in a fight, but I won. You're not going to not have fights. If you follow God, you're going to have fights, but it's, it's, it's your submission that causes the victory. I'll go back to the short wave just for a minute. And then, like I said, I learned something in, in that particular thing. He told me, the, the war is above human power. It is too big for you. You agree with me. I will fight the fight, and I will give you the spoils. Word for word. Word for word. He said, you agree with me. I need you to agree with me. The, power, the, the battle is too big for you. It's above human power. Some of your fights are above human and power, and all you can do is say, yes, Lord. But if you're too busy arguing, how are you going to say, yes, Lord? If you're too busy arguing with the person, or arguing, because usually you, gotta, you start arguing with people is when you lose the fight. You know, if you argue with people, you're probably going to lose. Sometimes you have to just submit to God. See, I, I, I hate preaching submission because it looks like I'm wanting, I think it's over. You, you know now by now that I'm not looking for you to submit to me like I'm some kind of boss or something. It's just God's system. I ain't got, I ain't got nothing in it. But in your submission is your protection and your agreement. And see, if you can agree with God, he can fight your fight. But the instant you start taking back and controlling, it becomes your fight again. The instant you talk against what you're wanting to go away, you're, 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 you're resurrecting it to fight you. You've got to let God fight some fights, period. He's bigger than whatever it is or whoever it is. Yes. It's just hard to do, isn't it? Because, see, the devil wants to hook you. Every time I'm hooked, I'm either too tired or I haven't spent enough time with God. And they both happen at the same time, usually. Or I, or I get run down, wear out emotionally, and then I become, how many of you get to where your body don't work right if you beat it all up and work too much? I appreciate your honesty. I hate to admit it to you. I've probably done it all, oh, maybe, I don't know, every day, of my, every day of my life for probably the first 35 years. And I'm a doer, so, you know, that creates problems, if you know what I mean. Uh, I want to be a doer. I, I want to be a doer. You know, I, I actually try to maximize time. I was read, reading where you redeem the time, you know. And you're really supposed to steward your time. You really are. That's, uh, you're supposed to make the best use of your time that you can. Anyhow, so submission and proper brokenness. Refusal uh, to break it will be trouble. You're going to laugh. I'm going to bring up a little movie. How many of you have seen Forrest Gump? Okay. You remember when uh, Lieutenant Dan stayed up on the telephone pole and was cursing God? Okay. Do you remember when he finally broke and he got a wife and he was all civil after that? That's about what it's like. Those of you who are gumpers, you know. I mean, that's, that's about what it's like. When he finally broke, he came civil to Forrest's wedding and acted like he was half human and he had a wife. He broke. He finally quit fighting with what he thought his destiny was. That, that was a very, very good example because he kept thinking what he was supposed to be and how his family did, and he was trying to live in something he thought when really he could have had a life the whole time. But it isn't until we break that we find it, and you hear me say this all the time, whoever loses his life finds it. Whoever tries to keep his life is the one that loses it. The tighter you squeeze, the less your life you're going to have. you got to let go and let God. Easier said than done, but it's over time. And you know what? You can take that same battle to your grave and never let go and just complain. Isn't that a horrible thought? You can never let go, and you'll take that same battle through 40 years. Scary, isn't it? I don't know why this is going to go. I don't know when it's going to go away. When you change... When you change, it's hard to do, especially, if, you know, 
I told you the one time, I think World War I and World War II both started in Croatia, and that's where my family's from. Very stubborn, unforgiving people. I mean, I think Croatians remember things God forgot about. You know, I mean, they're contentious, they, they're, 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 they're stubborn. I mean, I can go right down the list. And, and you know, I was thinking about all the, the cultures in the world. There's all kind of nationalities, right? I mean, there's Spanish people, South American people, Arab people, Swedish people. And see, what we're looking at is a whole bunch of difference that all God made, all those difference, the Brits, the French, everybody. And the problem is, none of those are redeemed personalities. You've got to get redeemed, and then what you were really created to do is what you become. When they're unredeemed, that's, this is what they look like. Some of those nations, I was listening to statistics last night. There are nations, the Scandinavian nations and Europe, there are nations where 78% of them are atheists. You know, like 78, 82%. Phenomenal amounts are atheists. Well, people that don't know Jesus, they don't act the same. Let alone the people who do know Jesus sometimes don't act right either. So you're dealing with all those people with unredeemed personalities. And that's their, un you're, we're looking at their unredemptive side. And see, the devil will tell you, the Scandinavians are no good, Kenyans are no good, white people are no good, black people are no good, women are no good. And really all it is is a plethora of unredeemed personalities of different cultures. Because every culture is different. Every culture is different. And unredeemed, they are what they are. When Rhea when and I went to Ghana, one of the things that re really blew me away was I found out they sold their own people as slaves to the British and uh, sold their people as slaves. And I thought, I didn't know that before I went, you know. And I thought, wow, their own inhumanity to their brothers and sisters in their country, how could they do that? Well, unredeemed, you can do a lot of things. You can do a lot of things. But every culture is capable of that. Like I said, don't put that in the white, black, none of that stuff. None of that's true. It's, it's, it's people that know the difference. It's God and not God. Unredeemed, we're all a mess. You know, we've all got a history of stuff. 1 Corinthians 1.19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Wow. In other words, he's saying, if you think you're wise, I will show you you're not. And I'll bring to nothing your understanding. I think those are so strong words. But he says, be not wise in your own eyes. I mean, it's funny. God says, above all, get wisdom. It's like you can't tell the difference sometimes because he tells you get wisdom, and then he says, don't be wise in your own eyes. You see, he wants you to have his wisdom. The human mind will take off and think that it knows everything. It really will. It's the age-old problem with humanity without God. But when you bring your mind, see, that's why you have to respect the word. I'm going to go back to the beginning now. This is all really fundamental, but it is so important. How many of you had your mind get away from you, and you woke up in like a couple weeks and thought, what in the world was I, why was I treating people, what is wrong with me? And you, then you have to go tell God, I'm really sorry, I was being an idiot. Thank God you got it worked out. You could have stayed that way. Do you remember that? Thank God that you learned the difference because you could stay that way and be blind for 40 years. The worst thing is not knowing what you don't know. So your mind, he wants you to be wise. He wants you to be smart. But it has to be subject to what is written first. What is written? What is written? You have to settle it in your hearts that thy word, O Lord, is forever settled in heaven. It is the highest form of truth, and everything else will yield to it someday. Someday there'll be a trial, and the devil, there is a trial. The devil's already been sentenced, it's just it hasn't been done yet. But there'll come a day when he comes with the army to, I saw heaven open, I would just quote the scripture, and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. And his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a noble name written that no man knew but himself. And the armies of heaven followed him, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. 
The only way to go to hell is reject the truth now. Isn't that interesting? The only way to go to... See, you can't blame God for sending anybody to hell because he, he sent his son to take the punishment so you didn't have to go. So he can't be the reason anymore. It has to be the rejection of the cornerstone that sends you. So it's your rejection of truth that sends you to hell. It's not your sins. My God. Isn't it funny? You've got to repent of your sins, but your rejection of the antidote is where the trouble really is. You've got to accept that somebody took the punishment so you wouldn't have to. Hell, hell and heaven to me are extremely simple, and they get real complicated with religion because religions keep score on everything. And that scorekeeping hides the truth of the gospel, he said. The scorekeeping hides the truth of the gospel. It's stuff that's added to it. It's added to it. You did this, you did that, they do this, they do that. That's added to it. The simple truth is, we were sinners, we repent of our sins, and we accept that Jesus took the punishment of our sins. And then your mind will go, well, what about this? What about that? No, no, that's not what it said. It didn't say that. It said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that those who believe in him would be saved and come to everlasting life. It's the rejection of that truth that causes the trouble. God is all about redemption, not about sending you to hell. He gave his life. What more could he do? Oh, how he loves me and you. Remember that song? So, you know, I was going to go to the family, but I'm, I'm not. I'm going to ask you to read Ephesians 5 for yourself. Read, read, read Ephesians chapter 5. Um, I will say this at the end. Uh, your, your house is a family, okay, but it's a church. Your house is a church. If you're a Christian hubby, if you're a Christian hubby, you're the uh, pastor of your house. You're, it says that you're supposed to love your wife as Jesus loved the church. Did the church deserve anything, or do we get it because God is perfect and faithful and he does what's right? Okay. You're supposed to love your family the way Jesus loved the church, and he gave himself for it. That's what, that's, you're the, you're the one that creates the atmosphere, or the, or the, not the atmosphere, women create the atmosphere, I got to say that, because they do. You're the one that sets the standard, okay? <laughs> you're going to lie, I'll just I'm gonna laugh, I'm going to create a little bit of a joke, but it's scriptural. Did you know the Bible says it's better to live on the roof with, in the snow than it is to live with a contentious wife? Ooh, it's just something everybody might consider. <laughs> it says you're better off to live outside than you are with a contentious woman. Now, now tell me she don't create the atmosphere. If we're God to say that, they definitely have an influence of how the atmosphere is going to be in the house. But anyway, he sets the, the, the standard of truth. John said, in John, Jesus said, I sanctify myself so they might be sanctified. If you're living dirty, you're dirty in your wife, man. If you're living dirty, when I say dirty, sinful or slothful, you're dirty in your own house. Because you have to sanctify yourself so your family can be sanctified. And thy word, the word is what sanctifies you. So if you're not living according to the word, you're dirty in your own house. Because sanctification is cleanliness. You're setting the tempo in your house by how clean you live according to God's word. Every time I read scripture, it always ends up to me with personal accountability. I just can't find anybody to blame. <laughs> I'm trying. It always ends up in my own lap. Is that, I'll make you feel that way. Pastor James, you read the Bible, all of a sudden it's your, everything's your responsibility, isn't it? You're stuck. I don't do that. I mean, I get, get convicted and nobody's there but me and God. I'm telling you. I read my Bible, I get convicted. And I think, wow. Lord, okay. Need some help. I repent of that. 
I repented yesterday of something. Yesterday morning, I'm repenting of something that God told me about my health, and I, didn't, I only did it for a while, and it's wanting to come back, and I thought, man, he gave me the out, and I didn't take it. So who do I blame? Me or God? You know, who am I going to blame? He gave me the out. I didn't follow through, and it's resurrecting itself. There's nobody to blame. Every time I read the Bible, it's always personal accountability. There is nobody to blame for anything. Remember the joke about the guy and his own lunch? I heard this years ago. This guy says, bologna sandwiches. Bologna sandwiches. I'm sick of bologna sandwiches. And the other guy says, why don't you have your wife pack something else? He goes, you shut up. I pack my own lunch. Well, that's about what it's like. It's like bologna sandwiches. We're, we're complaining but we're packing our own lunch. There's nobody to blame for it. You want your house to be better, be a better man. Because you're the thermostat. Well, she's a thermometer, but you're the thermostat. You're going to set the cleanliness and the godliness that is in your house by your behavior. And as the lead, you want to, everybody wants the wife to submit. I almost think it's a joke now because if the men's not submitted to God, it really doesn't work very well anyway. And you'll love this statement. <laughs> Look forward, I'll say it. I'm almost, the ladies, don't you get mad at me. I almost don't want to talk to the women. I want to talk to their husbands. If they won't listen to me or even talk with me, I want to say, I don't know what to tell you, ma'am. You're just going to have to tough it out till this guy figures it out. Because the men are the ones that are supposed to be leading the house. The women come to the church. A lot of times the men stay home. I mean, it's so backwards, it couldn't get any more backwards. It, the guy that's supposed to be leading is the guy that don't want to come. That's why when you have intercessors and stuff, it's usually always women, and women do all this stuff. But the men, you might, I, I'm the place where I just want to talk to men because I know I really can't get the house to change until I can get the word in them and the word change them. The word's got to get in, so the word, I can't change them at all. How many of you understand, understand there is nobody to blame? There's nobody to blame. It's accountability between you and God. Would you stand to your feet? Pray for your men. We're going to pray for the men right now. Because not having the men is only half the house. And the problem is that if the head don't come, how's the house going to really change if you can't get the head to change? Right? Right? That's our job, guys. It's our job, guys. Father, I thank you that we're going to pray for the men right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray for the men. God, we pray for the men. Help them, Lord, be sturdy, steady, stable, and hear the voice of God for themselves. God, let them hear the voice of God for themselves and then give them enough space to learn it and implement it. Push everything that's vexing them away long enough for them to get enough confidence to use what they know and find out what works and what don't. Everybody's got to work it, Lord. I never met anybody that did it right the first time or the second time or whatever. I'm asking you, God, for the men to have space to make decisions, to see how they work and learn what they don't know without any criticism or input from criticism, God, that they can learn and do it. But God, if they, you've got to give them the grace to do it and to want to. Father, as, so, as the head, so goes the house. As the head, so goes the country. As the head, so goes a corporation. Whatever it is, Lord, it always has a head. So I pray for the people, the families connected to this church and the future families for the women that are going to get married and the men that are going to get married. I pray, Lord, that the men are the head, not the boss, not the boss, the head, a leader, a genuine leader who's a servant leader who serves like Christ served the church in the name of Jesus. 
I got a little addendum in there because I've been married so long. Uh, a servant husband doesn't give you everything you want any more than Jesus gave the church everything it wanted. It just doesn't work that way. It works that he's going to take care of you and love you and protect you, but he can't give you everything you want. Some things God has to give you, and you're going to have to let God give it to you. He's not God. He's not God. So many men have been abandoned, which is most of the world now, and they always feel like they're failing because they can't give everybody everything they want not realizing that that really isn't leadership. Leadership is direction. Sanctification, cleanliness of the house and the spirit. It's all the things that, that, that men are supposed to be in leadership. God, I'm asking you to visit the family. The family's been under attack for so many years, decades, Lord. It took decades for them to destroy the family the way they have. I pray for the men and women and the children and families connected to this church, Lord, that you're rearranging them and you're getting them put together in a different way, God. Power of agreement, unity. God, rather than fix, I'm praying. I can't fix. I'm asking you, God, to go into the houses. Go into the houses right now, Lord, right now. Go into the hearts of the people that live in those houses right now. Right now, Lord, faith is now. The time is short, Lord. You, need, you really need these couples to do what you want to do, but you've got to get them past themselves first. Father, I thank you. You're going into the houses right now and do a work in the hearts of all the people. We bless you. We honor you. We thank you for an expected end, God, a result, a sanctification in the house, a cleanliness in the house. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen and amen.